Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to this meeting of the Planning and Development Council of the Town of Oakville. Uh, Madam Clerk, this evening we have regrets from uh, Councillor Duddick and I believe Councillor Robinson. Councillor, are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Madam Clerk, I see none. Um, Council, how about we resolve into Committee of the Whole? Councillor Adams moves, Councillor Elgar seconds, thank you. Uh, all in favor? And that carries. Committee of the Whole relaxes the rules in which we operate to permit greater public consultation. And uh, the first item before us tonight is a consent item, which means that it's an item that uh, staff expect would have no public uh, comment uh, and, uh, and, and no controversy associated with. Uh, Council, how do you want to deal with this consent item? We just need one person to move it. Councillor Adams is moving it. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed, if any. And the assumption of Pineberry West Phase 2 uh, plan has, uh, has been approved. There are no confidential consent items. Um, and there is a public meeting and recommendation report on the draft plan of condominium, common element, State View Homes, Ivory Oak Estates, uh, before us tonight. And if you give your attention to uh, our senior planner, Rob Thun, uh, he will summarize the matter to date. Uh, I know that council's read all of the uh, material, but uh, this is uh, by way of a public hearing and we'll be uh, polling the audience for comment after uh, Mr. Thun's presentation. Councillor Elgar. I, uh, I don't need the presentation, and I just wonder if there's anyone in the audience that needs the presentation. I'd say if not, I would, I would uh, move the recommendation. Are there any members of the public here with information for council on the Ivory Oak Estates matter? Going once, going twice. Sold to Councillor Elgar. I would uh, be pleased to move the staff recommendation. Thank you, Rob, for being ready. This means you did such a good job that there's no questions. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Opposed, if any, and that carries. Now, uh, the public meeting report for the zoning bylaw amendment for Stenbro Engineering uh, and the report from the Planning Services Department on pages 17 to 28 of tonight's agenda is next up. Uh, if you give your attention to uh, Trish, uh, she will brief the public and remind the council of what you've studied. Trish, we're all ears. Thank you, Mayor Burton. The purpose of this report is to introduce the zoning bylaw amendment application for 2358, <coughs> excuse me, eighth line, in conjunction with the required statutory public meeting. As noted by my report, which can be found on page 17 of tonight's agenda, there are no decisions to be made at this time and the report is to be received by council. The subject lands are located at 2358 8th Line and includes the property just north of that, shown here as identified as Block 116 on Plan 20M706 at the southwest corner of Ravine View and 8th Line. The application applied to both properties and the properties have since been merged on title by the applicants. The area surrounding the site has been developed, sorry, uh, has been developed as a subdivision with primarily two-story single, single detached dwellings. The subdivision was constructed approximately just over 15 years ago. The property has a total area of approximately 0.1 hectares with 20, 0. Yeah, 0. 0.1 hectares with 24 meters of frontage along 8th line and 36 meters along uh, Ravine, Ravine View Way. There's an existing detached home on the, on the 2358 property um, that will be demolished to permit the future development. The applicant seeks approval to permit the lands to be developed for three detached dwellings. The portion of the lands adjacent to Ravine View Drive are zoned RL8 and the balance of the lands are zoned RL5 Special Provision 1. The purpose of the application is to establish an RL8 zoning for the entire land holdings. And this would be consisting with, consistent with the rest of the neighborhood. Once zoning is in place, the lot will be severed into three lots with frontage along Ravine View Way. Site plan approval will be required for each of the, each of the dwellings prior to construction. 
The property is designated low density residential um, within the livable Oakville plan and is located within a stable residential neighborhood characterized by two story detached dwellings. Uh, any development on this property must conform to Part D, Section 11 of Livable Oakville Plan that speaks to the importance of compatibility with this, within the stable residential neighborhood that protect, protects the existing character of the surrounding neighborhood. Uh, policies in 11.1.9 of Livable Oakville speak to the compatibility of built form, including scale, height, massing, architectural character and materials, setback, lotting patterns, and access, to name a few of the things we're looking at. There is currently split zoning, which applies to the subject lands, as they were two different properties and now are one. The zoning is still split. The northerly portion, which was Block 116, is zoned RL8, and the balance of the subject lands are zoned RL5 Special Provision 1. Special Provision 1 um, is a provision that encompasses a lot of lots throughout Oakville, and it um, looks at minimum lot frontage area and front yard setback. The R8 zoning was put in place with when the rest of the surrounding subdivision was approved and the applicant proposes to rezone the southerly lands um, RL8 to facilitate the development of the three detached dwellings. The following matters have been identified for consideration as part of uh, the complete analysis for this application. Conformity with livable Oakville the compatibility of the new dwellings with the surrounding neighborhood. This includes, as I mentioned, lot sizes, setbacks, and massing, including the floor area of the new, new dwellings, and the impacts to surrounding residents. The next steps include finalizing the analysis of the application and coordination of it reviewing agency comments. In conclusion, staff put forward the following recommendation, as shown, for Council's consideration that comments from the public with respect to the zoning bylaw amendment application for 2358 8th line be received. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Collingwood. Councillor Adams. Thank you very much for the presentation. I have two questions for you. The first is uh, regarding noise levels in the outdoor living area on the corner lot. Um, could you add that to the issues list for a response uh, when the report comes back ultimately? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I will. Thank you very much. And the other is not really uh, a matter regarding the zoning bylaw. It's really a matter of during construction uh, to ensure that there are adequate securities and adequate procedures in place to ensure that the neighbors on both 8th line and the Ravine View Way side are not uh, put into discomfort, I'll say, with respect to mud tracking, construction vehicles, and that sort of thing. Through you, Mr. Mayor. This was... Um one of the concerns that was brought up during the public information meeting, and we will be doing that through the site plan process for all three dwellings. Okay, and you'll be able to respond to that particular question during the reporting as well? Yes. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. If there are no uh, questions from the audience, then I'll gladly move the receipt. Thank you, Councillor. Are there members of the public with information for Council on this matter? Going once, going twice. Councillor's motion is in order. Any discussion? All in favour? And that carries. Thank you, Councillor. That brings us to the discussion item tonight, the Lakeshore Road Streetscape Project, the furnishing theme recommendation. And uh, Mr. Cozy, are you prepared? Yes, good evening, Mayor and members of Council. <clears throat> I have a presentation here. Uh, so thank you once again. Um, I should only take a few minutes here to brief you on the report and uh, answer any questions that you may have. Uh, Town Council previously approved the Downtown Transportation and Streetscape Study in the spring of 2015. Uh, the DTS study provided a master plan for all streets in downtown Oakville. Uh, it also in recommended a contemporary theme for materials and furnishings. Um, Council uh, provided staff approval to proceed with the Lakeshore Road Reconstruction and Streetscape Project, which is planned for a 2019 to 2020 implementation, two years. Uh, that project also includes the Lakeshore Road Bridge Rehabilitation Project. That project is slated to start early in 2017. The engineering design phase for the Lakeshore Road Streetscape Project 
and the bridge project commenced in the summer of 2015. Materials and furnishing options um, uh, were presented during public consultations in the spring of 2016, and that was based on the approved contemporary theme. Um, there was significant negative feedback received uh, from the public on the contemporary theme for the street, specifically for the street lights, the benches, the bike rings, and the bollards. Um, conversely, there appeared to be fairly positive feedback with regards to the granite pavers and curbs and the proposed uh, metal waste receptacles. Uh, council considered the negative public feedback that was received and at its uh, meeting in late July of this past summer provided staff with the following direction. Now the, the following four bullets is just a summary of your of your direction. It's not a direct quote but I believe it covers the intent and that was to firstly relaunch the public engagement process with traditional contemporary and classical furniture options that being street lights, benches, bike rings and bollards to move forward with the granite curbs and pavers and waste receptacles. And that was important because we are moving forward with the Lakeshore Road Bridge project shortly. And to further develop options for Lakeshore Road that would provide in whole or in part a flexible or what some of us refer to as a curbless street. And to report back to you in early 2017. So I'm here tonight to present right now the results of the first phase of the public engagement process. So uh, staff developed a two-phased approach to address council's direction uh, in order to relaunch the public engagement. The first phase was all about selecting the theme. So we were focusing on concepts, which included photos of furnishing examples to provide people the understanding of what the theme would look like. We held several in-person sessions. The downtown farmers market on two consecutive Saturdays was very successful even though the second Saturday it rained a lot. Uh, we had well over 200 people attending uh, just those sessions. Um, we had uh, four other sessions, uh, 16 Mile Creek, Sports Complex, Iroquois Ridge Community Center, QEP and the Glen Abbey Arena uh, as well and those were during weeknights. And we of course we held a public open house just a couple of weeks ago uh, here at Town Hall. In addition to all that, we had an online feedback process which was very well received. We had over a thousand people participate on the online feedback and we had well over 300 people uh, participate in the in-person sessions. The second phase will, all, will be all about selecting the actual furnishings and we'll, go, we'll be going back to the public with sweet options. So as I said earlier, I think I said 1,300, but I meant to say over 1,400 people attended the sessions or provided online feedback. And these are the results. 860 people, 67 people preferred traditional, 300 preferred classic, and 264 preferred contemporary. And we received many comments from individuals indicating a desire to keep and reuse the existing, and I'll call them Acorn streetlights. So based on the public process, we've conducted so far, staff is recommending a traditional theme. Phase two of the public engagement will commence later this autumn and that will consist of internal meetings by staff to review and recommend the suites of options. We want to make sure that we're recommending options to the public to consider that meet our standards. We will be following up with a report to Heritage Committee to outline options and receive their feedback. And then we'll hold a public open house, preferably shortly after the heritage meeting, and presenting those suite options. Um, and where possible, we'll have as many of these mater materials to be on hand for viewing. And I say that because it's not easy to get everything here um, and be available for viewing. We'll make every attempt to get everything here. Uh, the items that we can't have, we'll have uh, photos. Online feedback will continue, similar to phase uh, one, uh, providing those individuals with the opportunity to view, view and select preferred suites uh, from home. Uh, staff will then review the results and we will post the recommended suite option online. And we believe that will be in around uh, January. I failed to mention we're planning the public meeting to be uh, late November, early December. So we'll be posting the results um, in early January uh, we will be reporting to council in either late January or early February, depending on the 
council uh, schedule. And uh, we'll then be going to Heritage Oakville for a permit uh, in February. Once all these um, um, steps are completed and we have final approval, we'll adapt those selections um, into our Lakeshore Road Bridge project, which will at that point already be underway. So we're going to have to make arrangements to retrofit some of these items uh, into the project. The existing street lights, just want to talk about those briefly. Uh, I can assure you that will be considered as an alternate within the proposed suite options. We will be conducting a technical review and cost benefit analysis of the existing street lights. So we'll be looking at things such as their life cycle, their current condition, uh, the issue of how to address attachments on the poles, uh, design issues relating to lighting levels and spacing requirements between the poles, uh, and construction costs. So, so for example, um, taking them down, shipping them into storage, uh, reconditioning them, uh, converting them to LED, and then of course their reinstallation. And we'll be comparing those costs to what it would cost to buy new similar poles based on what the public uh, prefers, um, and, and making, uh, making, I guess, a recommendation to you ultimately on which poles should go. Um, review will be issued so that review will be used to assist the public and council to understand what would be involved in reusing these poles it's not just as simple as let's reuse them they they, they need to be reconditioned there needs to be certain things done to them um, and it'll, and again it'll assist us in making a recommendation to council flexible street options uh, we're still in the process of developing the detailed engineering design we've been focusing a little bit on uh, most of a little bit or most of our time on the uh, on the furniture selections lately um, so we're still in the process of developing the detail engineering design we uh, are looking at an option to provide a curbless street along the entire section that is navy to allen um, and there's also the uh, option that was recommended in the in the dts study which is to just build it in front of town square so we'll be looking into this we'll include this in the second phase of the public consultation get people's input to see what they would prefer um, and we'll be reporting back to council with a recommendation. Now, here's the rub. I don't know if we can get back to you at the same time we recommend the furnishings. Um, more than likely, we'll be, we'll be preparing a separate report to you um, uh, later in the winter time discussing the, um, uh, the, the, the flexible street option. And that's my presentation, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Mr. Cozy. Council, uh, we have a delegation, at least one. Uh, do you have any questions? Councillor Hutchins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cozy. I'm very glad that uh, you're going to be reassessing the acorn lights and, and letting us know um, how, if, if and how they can be properly re reused or some sort of uh, taller, similar looking, or something like that. Um, the benches, I think you said there's going to be a limited number of things you can bring in. One of the things I, I recommend is the benches because when the last time we'd had the benches there, the, the bench that was selected was so high that most women sitting on it couldn't touch the floor. It, so it's uncomfortable to have your feet dangling. So uh, we need to make sure that the benches are are suitable. <clears throat> um, my last question is in the uh, second phase, the timing of bringing back the possibility of the flex street. Are we talking about a month, two months, three months after the original or some other time limit, six months? No, I, I would believe that time frame within three months after this the follow-up report. Okay, very good. I would be pleased to recommend it after this too. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Cozy, um, received an email from a constituent the other day concerning the new LED lighting on a particular street, indicating that he felt the beams were too narrow, and as a result, there was a lot of uh, still dark area that needed to be covered. Will you be considering this in this new uh, new setup? We'll be designing the street lights to. Uh our standards. Um, I received your email uh, earlier uh, this afternoon. Um, I don't know what, what happened in the case of uh, that particular individual. 
but our roads and works operation department have been alerted of that. I believe it seemed to me that that constituent was um, uh, bringing to your attention a recent conversion of the, the light from high pressure sodium to LED and I forwarded it to uh, our colleagues in, in Roads and Works for them to address it to see if everything is, is working appropriately. Through you, Your Worship, um, Mr. Cosey, this is a very good start on this report and moving forward with the streetscape. However, I also have uh, constituents uh, indicating about the LED lights, and sorry to mix and match with this report, the LED, but I think what we, I would suggest uh, that we really clarify to the public about LED lighting is if we're moving into hard scaping and so forth with light standards and so forth, it's very important that the, that the uh, community knows about LED lighting and what the benefits and what the disadvantages are because right now there's information out there and I think it's old information and technology is changing as we speak. And I think that's going to be a sensitive button uh, even when we put into uh, the light standards uh, downtown the design, but the LED lighting is, is something that uh, we need to consider and what is appropriate for us. My question, my, my second question with this is um, going into the next phase, is it the same consultant we're using uh, in this second phase of, uh, or was this done by staff, the, the original uh, well, surveying? This, this, the, the, the project team consists of town staff and uh, two consultants, and um, they were all involved in the, uh, in the first phase of the public consultation. Mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, we'll, we'll all be involved in the second round, but staff is leading it. I, I'd, I'd just like to quickly answer your first question. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I didn't There wasn't really a question, but I interpreted yeah. what the question was. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Cook. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, the town has standards uh, with regards to the new LED conversion program. In fact, council's already approved the implementation of the first round of the, the, the LED conversion, and it's focused on um, the conversion of cobra heads, non-traditional, non-sorry, non-decorative uh, type lights, so uh, cobra heads, square pack uh, type lights, and that's generally focused in on, on the busier streets. There's been some residential applications where they were, where they were converted. Um, the town has approved of what what is deemed, and, and I, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to sound like I'm, I'm a total expert on this stuff, and believe me, I'm not, but I, I do have this information. The, the, the standard is based on fourth, a 4K design standard. Uh, what I can tell you is there's 4K, and then, for example, there's 3K, and 3K is more yellow light, yellow light, like high pressure sodium, and 4K is, is LED, white, some people refer to blue light or varying levels of blue light. Um, the town's approved 4,000K, uh, 4,000K, sorry, 4K, um, and uh, going forward, you, there's a report coming to council or to budget committee, sorry, later this fall discussing the next phase of the conversion, which is going to involve the balance of the decorative lights, not, not the lights downtown, but there are other decorative lights in, the, in, uh, in residential areas, like the coach lantern style, uh, and addressing the budget for that and what the recommendation will be. Four, 4K lights are what is what 95% of North American municipalities are using. Um, I've been advised it more closely resembles natural moonlight than yellow light um, and that it provides, a, it's, it's more clear uh, light and, um, and safer, uh, creates a safer environment uh, in terms of, you know, criminal activity, et cetera, because it's brighter. Um, I know that the town's conversion program, each light is being retrofitted uh, with a device that will allow them to be dimmed. And so there'll always be that option for the town to consider dimming the light. But if our standard, if our town standard is 4K, Councillor, we will design the lights to 4K. And um, we will recommend the, the lights based on that standard. And at the end of the day, if that's acceptable to you, you can approve that or you can advise us to, to do something different. The, the issue with the light poles today is their height uh, to bring them to current standard, we have to we have to place more of them, so to tighter spacing than what's currently there. If we went to a similar light pole, let's say the exact same pole, but brand new that was four feet higher, um, you could probably deal with the spacing uh, much more effectively. 
Um, at the end of the day, we can reuse the light poles. There's going to be a cost to do that. And I think the public and you should be aware of what that cost is before we make that decision. No one's here saying you can't use them, but we're going to have to live up to the, some of the, the downsides of the existing poles, which is the attachments. And um, because you can't attach anything to them other than, and I've been using, using the term MacGyvering, uh, straps to the poles to attach any street sign, any parking sign, any planter, or any banner. And if that's suitable to the public and to council, that's fine, then we'll continue strapping the poles. Um, but they can't be retrofitted. I don't believe they can be retrofitted to accept brackets. Um, but we'll make that decision at the appropriate time. But I just wanted to give you that, that little update. Thank you, Mr. Cozy. Councillor Hutchins. Uh, yes, Mr. Cozy. Um, when you talked about 4K, that's 4,000 Kelvin you're talking about which is the color temperature of the lights. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so 6,500, 6,700 is daylight, tends towards the blue, looks very <coughs> sharp, and is, is, is but, and 3,000 to 3,500, 3,700 is like your incandescent bulb at home, just for clarity. You know what you're talking about, Councillor? Yes, thank you. For the public's benefit, Councillor Hutchins is in the LED business, <laughs> and he is somewhat familiar with these terms that he's sharing with us. Did I see a hand over here? I've got one over here first. I'm going to go to Councillor Lischina, and then we'll come back to you, Councillor Gittings. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cozy, for that report. I'm curious in the, the survey that, uh, of the residents uh, in this phase, um, what kind of interest do you receive uh, from residents all over, um, all over town or mostly uh, those who live in the downtown core? I don't have with me, Councillor Zichina, I don't have with me um, um, a map showing the location of the residents that responded. We do have that information, but I don't have the map with me that shows a, a distribution based on the first three letters of your postal code. But we were in um, all areas of the town. Uh, in the north and the east and the west. And you know, we believe we received a, a good selection of, of residents um, that attended in person anyways. Um, the, the, small, the sessions that were at the arenas were roughly about 20 to 30 people per session. Um, and like I said, the farmer's market was fantastic. That's a great way to engage the public. Uh, probably a great way to, you know, any, any sort of big significant project, probably not a bad idea to do that again. Um, but all I can say is it appeared to us that we had representation from uh, throughout the town, uh, but I don't have the specifics, sorry. Councillor Giddings. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. You talked about MacGyvering street poles with zip ties. What about the GFI uh, receptacles? I know that the BIA has ongoing battles with windstorms and water and ice and salt and darkness. Well, thanks for reminding me. Uh, I did fail to mention that. Uh, that is another issue with the poles because those GFIs have been retrofitted onto the pole, on the outside of the pole, with a supposed weatherproof protective cover. Supposed. And we found that it is not very weatherproof. And the proof is in the pudding. Our, our traffic operations staff are there on a continual basis trying to deal with these, 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 these receptacles blowing out. Could, could one of you, just because I know there are people who have no idea what GFI is, could one of you say this in English? That would be a ground fault interrupter. interrupter. The thing that snaps off when you have water on your switch. It has a built-in fuse, so it's similar to um, what you would have outdoors in a, in a newer home now if you installed a, a hot tub, you would have a, a GFI receptacle. So I was in the middle, now I forgot what I was saying. Was I answering your question? You did a superb the, job. Yeah, so, this, yeah, so the GFI, so we're, we're, that is a concern and it, we're gonna be comparing that to what's available, let's say on a new pole, where those GFIs, for example, will be embedded within the, within the pole itself. All right, and you could go with a lower unit or a taller unit. So just to follow this, if you had a lower unit, you'd have more, smaller distance between them. 
and a taller unit would allow you to go with lesser number of street poles. Yes. Based on the LED. Go ahead. So the, the GFIs that would, be in, that would be provided on all the poles will not be the only GFIs that we're providing. Those would, be a, those would be provided for, let's say, decorative attachments. We all know that there's a lot of festivals going on in the downtown, and those festivals require specific power requirements that exceed plugging into a GFI. Uh, so for example, uh, bands playing music, et cetera. So we'll be providing selectively, we'll be working with the BIA to establish those receptacle connections probably within the planter beds. So that, that, that could be access for music. In addition, there'll be other GFIs at ground level um, installed to support the, the quantity that's on the poles. So a right. little so bit for, of everything. For the, for the number of poles, uh, I'm just curious how you're going to get feedback on the number of lights we're going to have downtown because I, I don't know whether people are thinking about what the actual quantity or the distance between them will be, but that would certainly affect the BIA and the ability to hang plants and banners and lights and d different things. Yes, I mean, you know, if, if, if we continue to strap the, the brackets onto the poles, um, you know, they'll, the existing poles, that is, they'll, they'll be able to hang the planters as they do today. I was, the point I was trying to make, counselors, is that if we have X rece uh, GFI receptacles today, we'll have X plus Y going forward because we're going to add every pole is going to have one plus additional receptacles in the planting beds for both 220 and standard voltage. So we're going to have more than enough receptacles to suit the BIA's needs downtown. All right, and you talked about decorative lights. You have a report coming to budget. Uh, the lights that are currently there, and if you get something similar, uh, chances are the light's going to have the same pattern. We don't have a dark sky policy downtown. It's uh, a lot of the light goes up through the top of the fixture currently. And if it were a similar fixture, I'm just concerned about the, what some people consider to be the yes. harshness that we're going to be uplighting uh, to a much greater degree than we are now. I, I understand that, and I, I um, all I can say, I need to replace the microphone. Um, we will be designing, we'll be dealing with these, these issues, and... Um, uh, I, at this point, I don't know what more I can say about that other than we'll, we'll deal it's with something that. something you're going to be considering. Sure. All right, last question. Uh, you talked about the farmer's market, and uh, I agree. It was uh, the best uh, number of people that were there. If we could get samples of the furniture, uh, the, it may be a little chilly for the farmer's market when you get it, but we do have a number of events downtown uh, through end of October and November. I would uh, love to see you make a good effort to try to get them uh, to the downtown area, whether it be the benches, the receptacles, the lights, to let people have a look. Yeah, I, I just, we'll try, but I just caution. It's, it's difficult because we're dealing with suppliers that have to ship the material to our, our premises and then pick them up. Uh, generally, we only have them for a few days. Uh, they want them back. Um, so we'll try our best, but I can't commit that we're going to have them. Uh, we'll leave it with you. We'll leave it with us. We'll try our best. Councillor Chisholm. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, Councillor Giddings uh, triggered a, a question with respect to the, uh, the lighting, and we're talking LED lights. If the conversion happens, Mr. Cozy, to LED lighting, which I would assume that's going to happen, would there be a reduction of, of light standards in the downtown, or would there be more, or would we be at the same uh, capacity right now? Okay, so I'm going to answer that two parts. The, okay. the, the lights downtown will not be converted as part of the town's conversion program. They'll be either up converted or replaced as part of this project in 2019 and 2020. Okay. okay. So they're not being converted in the, in the short term. Um, in terms of the light, my understanding is that 4,000K was, is, does sort of resemble the lighting level of what's out there today. It's just because it's a different spectrum, it appears a lot different to, to, to people because it's a different spectrum of light. But in terms of the brightness, my understanding is it's roughly the same. But 
I, I'm not speaking from a point on a point of authority here. Not to put you in the position. So what we're saying is the light standards based on what we have equivalent today would be the same number of light standards in the downtown. That was my question. Would no, that no, no, I'm not committing to that. Based on the standard, um, if we salvage the existing light poles downtown, we may have to acquire additional ones and install them at a tighter spacing to achieve the town standard, unless okay. you tell us otherwise. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Mr. Cozy. Um, are there, uh, Madam Clerk, we have at least two registered delegations on this matter. Um, since I see no more questions by Council, would you call the first delegation? The first delegation on this matter is Ms. Susan Johnston, Acting Executive Director from the Downtown Oakville BIA. Welcome, Ms. Johnson. We look forward to your information and, uh, and your handout. Thank you, Mayor Burton and members of council for allowing me to speak this evening and express the opinions of the downtown Oakville BIA members. So I have a short little presentation, which you're getting a handout of. And sorry if the writing's a bit small, but I was trying to save a bit of paper. So to, yep. No, I only brought it on, on hard copy, sorry. Um, to align with what uh, the direction of council to have staff go back and reconvene public consultation on the matter of theme of furniture for the downtown Oakville street streetscape project. We also uh, re-engaged our members with an online survey. We don't have, um, I'll say, a lot of luck having members come out in person, so we've, uh, we typically get best response through email. So uh, from September 9th to September 23rd, we had an online email survey out to members, and we have about uh, 400 members. Our typical survey response is in around 10% or 40 people. We had 36 people respond back to this survey, and thankfully we'll say the response was uh, similar to that of the general public, where there was uh, over 40% in favor of a traditional furniture theme for the downtown, followed by classic uh, and then contemporary. So in terms of uh, the BAA's preference, it definitely is traditional. And I would say in previously when the contemporary theme was chosen, the members were engaged as part of the, the public consult. There wasn't a separate uh, online survey done for, for the BAA members to pick theme. Oh, and there it actually comes up there, magic. Um, so that's, Pretty much it for my, uh, if you can see it, this is my first time doing this. Okay. So there you go. So that's just the summary saying that the preference was for the traditional theme furniture. And I'll just flip it. And a bit small, but quickly, uh, the survey question, and we used the same language that the town used in terms of the survey and we allowed our members to link into the same bank of photographs for the traditional contemporary and classic theme furniture. And then we asked them to, uh, to come back to our survey site and provide their, their response. So, and there, and there you can see, albeit a bit blurry, the uh, yellow bar at the top shows the preference for the traditional furniture and uh, classic in the orange and contemporary is the blue. So lined up with the general population. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hutchins has a question for you. Let's see how everything lines up with that. <laughs> Hi, Susan. Thank Hi. you very much for uh, the presentation. Mm -hmm. um, you heard how uh, Mr. Cozy is going to be going out to the public, not only on the streetscape stuff, but later on we'll be bringing back the Lakeshore Road, or that should be a flex street or yep. not, and so on. Are you planning to go to your members and ask the same question, or does the BIA have a position on this? We typically like to get the opinion of our members as opposed to coming up with one ourselves. So absolutely, we will, we will do that. We like to follow whatever the town is doing. If we can also get that same feedback from our members, that's our preference. Seeing no other questions, then thank you very much for your information this evening. Thank you. Madam Clerk, would you call the next delegation? 
The next delegation speaking to this issue is Trish McTavish, speaking on behalf of a concerned group of citizens. Good evening. Good evening. Council's looking forward to your information. Thank you. Your Worship, Mayor Burton, and members of Council, good evening, and thank you for allowing us this opportunity. My name is Trish McTavish, and I live at 53 Navy Street. I'm part of a group of concerned citizens who have been actively involved in the consultation process to select a style of street furnishings and lighting for our cherished downtown. I'm here tonight to say firstly that we fully support the staff recommendation that Council approve a traditional style theme for the street lights, benches, bike rings, and bollards. We believe that a traditional theme is consistent with the Town Council's vision for the downtown, which is to create an attractive, active, animated, and vibrant downtown where people come together to live, work, stay, shop, meet, and engage. It will be the cultural, social, and economic heart of our community where citizens and visitors can celebrate and experience the natural setting, heritage, culture, and the arts. As we look towards phase two of the selection process, we would ask that Council approve a more comprehensive engagement process beyond the planned online feedback and one public meeting outlined in the staff report. Our primary concern is the street lights, both in terms of their form and the lighting impact. In terms of form, the staff report highlights that were many comments from residents indicating a preference to keep and reuse the existing acorn lamps where feasible. There are currently 278 acorn light standards downtown on Lakeshore Road and the surrounding streets, and another 10 in Lakeside Park, six in Centennial Square, eight in Town Square, and four in Georgia Square. Given our history, and the importance that the downtown has with the origins of our town, its association with White Oak, the town logo, and the natural link to the acorn, we think that all efforts should be made to retain this light form. We have been in touch with King Luminaire, the Burlington, Ontario company that produced the current acorn street lamps. I personally spoke with the company, and they still make these street lamps, and they are available in different heights. They also make an LED conversion kit, and while some of the older street lamps might not be able to be retrofitted, they've indicated that they can be replaced with new acorn lamps with LED that are of the same form. From a maintenance perspective, the lamp standards can be powder coated and will last 15 to 20 years. One company, Powder Coatings of Mississauga, uses a five-step process and offers a large number of standard colors and even two quality levels of paint. Since the poles need to be dismantled before they are delivered to the coating factory, the regeneration of the acorn lamps could be done during the phased reconstruction period of the downtown streets. In terms of lighting impact, which the councillors have brought the subject up tonight, getting the right CCT, which I think Nick stands for correlated color temperature, or LED, is critical. From our research, we think that it is important to learn from the experiences of other communities who have gone down this road 
to ensure that the impact of the lighting maintains an appropriate ambience and minimizes any potential negative impact on the night sky due to brightness or glare. We have provided Adam Kiley in the town's engineering department with a brief on our research and the experience of the city of Davis, California in particular. One of the key learnings from Davis' experience was the value of a pilot testing of the actual lights to see and gauge their impact. When it comes to the street furniture and the benches in particular, I love the idea of bringing them to downtown Oakville to try because that's exactly what we're requesting. We think it's important to recognize that these benches are not just decorative in downtown Oakville. They're always in use and as a result, comfort has to be the primary focus. Although metal benches, as was shown in one of the um, options for traditional possible, they may be a potential option within the traditional theme. We're concerned that they run the risk of being too hot in the summer, too cold in the winter, and too hard at all times. As such, we think that wooden options would be more appropriate. It's critical that we invest the time now in this phase two to ensure that the final choice for downtown Oakville street lighting and furniture is consistent with and promotes the character of and ambience of our historic downtown. So, our request to council regarding phase two is twofold. First, we would like to see every effort made to retain the ACORN light standards through a combination of reuse and building new light standards that match. We recognize that selective lighting infill may be required for some specific areas such as along the bridge and at certain intersections and believe that a complementary designs incorporating the ACORN at different heights are possible. This has been seen in examples in both Port Hope in downtown Burlington. Second, we would like to see samples in situ, downtown, including various light options and furniture so that people can physically interact with the options and experience the impact. As Nick was saying about the benches and that you couldn't, the feet, your feet didn't touch the ground, you don't get that from a photograph, unfortunately. We think that this is critical to a successful selection process prior to going to council for approval. Before I close, I would like to share some Oakville history with you. I don't know how many of you have seen these photos. I have copies that can be handed out. Perhaps I, I have 10, so maybe they can be shared. Thank you. I'll give you here, I'll give you. <coughs> Jamie McRae, who's here tonight, has provided these photos of his grandfather. Oh, there we go. Don't show up well. Of his grandfather, Monty McRae, who isn't in the first one, but I believe Jamie's grandmother is, and their schooner Anitra from 1935. I would like to draw your attention to the bridge in the background, and in particular, to the acorn-styled street lamps in the red circles. There's a series of three photos that show the bridge. And the lights. Very similar to the acorn-style street lamps we enjoy today. The last photo isn't from 1935, it's from 1969 with the modern bridge and light standards. In 1969, they were considered contemporary. Today, they're considered outdated. 
The first three pictures show we have a long history with our timeless acorn lights. We are merely the current stewards of downtown Oakville, our little heritage gem. There have been many generations before us, and there will be many generations after us. Let's make sure we get this right on our watch. Thank you tonight for your attention and for the opportunity to present to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation and uh, the walk down memory lane. Are there questions? Councillor, Councillor Grant. As I have to phrase this in a question, um, are you aware that your research doesn't have to take you very far from town hall uh, as far as lighting goes? Um, down McCraney Street East at Six Line, which is just two minutes from here, uh, we were concerned that the lighting, the, the LED lighting, would light up the sky, change the character of the neighborhood. Uh, but we stuck by Mr. Cozy's recommendations. And when it was installed, the lighting was negligible from what we had before with the old system. So I, I would trust staff when they say that the lighting that they were going to propose would be consistent with what we expect. I, I, I certainly hope that's true. However, you don't have to hope. Just go down the street and I, you can take I a have, look. I have driven along Rebecca Street between Third Line and Fourth Line and just about been blinded as you look up. Well, perhaps we were a little bit louder at the time then, but uh, if you go down the street, take a they're, look. They're new. They've just been put in, in, okay, in well, along the, Rebecca. Okay, well, these are about three years old, I believe, so, but uh, certainly. Well, now. We don't need to argue about that. No, we won't. <laughs> and, and staff have already made it plain that uh, there's going to be trials and demonstrations. Thank you. So uh, I have more questions for you, though. Councillor yes. Elger is next. I appreciate your presentation. I think you raised an awful lot of good points. Thank you. Regarding the benches, yes. do you know, can you, re I, I can't just remember, what are the benches like in Niagara-on-the-Lake? Do you have any idea? I don't. Uh, it's not a trick question. I just wonder if, if they're wooden or what they are. Uh, they're, they're like a, park, a wooden park bench. Wooden park bench. Yes. I thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Councillor O'Meara, thank you for holding your hand up that long. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, given what we heard in terms of the functionality of the existing poles, uh, GFI, um, problems with the BIA in terms of signage and, and things that go on them, um, would you st still be willing to forego sort of the new uh, function that we require out of our light posts just to have the old acorn posts? Well, I'm, I'm certainly not an engineering expert on the GFI. I do have a couple of people here who are. And would you be it's willing not, to address the GFI not, part? Not GFI this? in particular. There were a number of things that our staff, just the functionability, whether it's, it's places to hang signs, places to hang banners. I, I think the comment was that our existing signs don't have some of the functions now, which, which many other communities and, and business districts take for granted to, for promotional materials or plugging in Christmas lights or these sorts of things. If we couldn't get those on the old signs, you would still prefer, or on the old posts, you'd still just prefer to keep the old posts, or, or would that factor into your, your decision making? I think it's clear that it's not just my opinion, but the majority of people who we've spoken to, which I have to say is hundreds, don't want to see those lights changed. So I would say that they're hopefully is some type of a compromise situation in this day and age where something can be done to the existing coal poles to retrofit them. Okay. I, I think there's companies that can do anything with anything these days. I'm sure there is. And, there, and I, yeah. I think that would be the part that should be thoroughly investigated. No, thank you very much. Thank you, Worship. Um, earlier when you were sharing your information with us, did I hear correctly? I thought I heard you to say that the maker of the original poles is still making them, 
and that new ones could be had from them that would look like the old ones yes. but have all the modern conveniences built into them. Is, yes. is that what you presented? Well, that's what they've told me. Okay, so. And, and they said that they're actually still providing poles in cases where there's new poles needed in Oakville. Sure. So if it, if it came to that, you would be just as happy with new ones that matched the old ones but had the modern conveniences, I assume. Is that right? Um, I would say that if, the, if a pole is old enough that it can't be retrofitted with LED. Oh, no, we're talking about brackets to hang uh, the BIA signs and baskets and, uh, and to build in the GFI circuits into the base. There's a, there's a range of uh, um, I think of Stephen would like to address this from our group, if he may. He's sure, the engineer, uh, and I'm not. All I, right, well, thank you very I much. I apologize, Your Worship. Thank you for coming and, thank and you. starting the conversation. And uh, if Stephen would like to identify himself. Yeah, I'm, my name is Stephen Hott. I live at uh, 226 William Street. So, Stephen, Downtown. If, if I may call you that, would you uh, help us understand this? Uh, tell me if I'm wrong. I heard, I think I heard, that we can have brand new polls and that they can have all these uh, conveniences that we want built into them rather than strapped onto them um, if we buy new ones. And so what I'm trying to get at is, is there a preference for the old ones uh, or can they be new as long as they look like the old ones? That's all. Oh, I'm I think they can be new. And in fact, I think we have a lot of trust that the staff of the town would be able to come up with something that would be a compromise and with engagement with the community there could be a, a solution that could be either new uh, or it could be a, a reuse of the existing acorn lights. Um, I think the big concern we have is about the color spectrum. And I'm a little surprised tonight to learn that uh, the town has adopted 4K as a standard. Um, and I, we mentioned the situation in Davis, California. They, they did a study, they've actually put up some lights for people to look at before they installed the lights. They put up 4K, 5600K. They installed 1400 lights at 4K, because that was the preference, and everybody hated them. The Davis, California had then went back and took out 1400 street lights at 4K and put it in at 2700K, 2.7K or 2700 versus 4000. The key point is, and you talked about being a yellow light, it's actually a warmer light. And we're talking about a unique area of Oakville, downtown. This is a heritage area, which was previously he, he, uh, light, lit by maybe a, a, a gas lamps, would have been lit by incandescent lights. In fact, there's the Oakville Hydro has in its lobby the original, one of the original electric lights, uh, direct current. Um, and it would have been a warm light. And the warm light looks right against the heritage buildings, which were brick and were built at a time when we had warm lighting. So there's an incongruity here that if we put up a light with 4K, which tends to be a little bluish, it doesn't work. It doesn't match. And so it's a, it's a problem. And we're here trying to help the town making a mistake. And I think it's really critical that we see what these lights would look like. We're talking about not the streetscape, we're concerned about the nightscape. I mean, downtown Oakville at night is lovely, it's beautiful. We want people to come out, enjoy the streets and the restaurants and so forth. I think if the light was bluish and was harsh against our heritage buildings, it would lose the ambiance. And I think it's really important that, that we try to maintain that, that look. I know maybe 4,000 is a standard, or 4K is a standard, it may not be right for downtown Oakville. And we just ask that you give special consideration to the needs of downtown Oakville to have the right hue of, of light. And I think it can only be done by putting up, you know, half a dozen lights, maybe with different uh, levels of um, color temperature. And hopefully we would see that maybe something around 2700 as, as Davis, California saw, was the most appropriate lighting for heritage districts, uh, parks, residential streets, um, whereas maybe 4K is perfectly fine for newer communities, busier streets, heavier traffic, and so forth. Um, 
you know, it was not, the traffic doesn't move very fast along Lakeshore Road between Navy and uh, Allen, so we don't need to have highway standard of a lighting. But we do need to have something that is warm and distinctive and makes people feel as if we're in uh, in an older part of Oakville, the OLDE part of Oakville. And, and, and that's what we hope. We hope that you'll listen to our concerns, that you'll adapt the study design that would be able to incorporate an evaluation of just not the look of the lamppost, but what the lamppost makes everything else looks like. And, and, and that's our concern, and we hope that uh, for, for the sake of downtown Oakville and the sake of the town, maybe having to replace a bunch of lights after citizens really get upset when they get the wrong color of light, um, that I think that this is a time to do it and do it properly. Thank, thank you. Thank you for clearing that up. Uh, Councillor Hutchins. <coughs> Uh, no. <laughs> Thank you. That, this should be easily done because you can have a bunch of bulbs which are 3,000 Kelvin or 6,700 Kelvin or 4,000 Kelvin, it doesn't matter. You just switch one bulb to the other and you could have even mm -hmm. a set of lights and changed. So they operate much on the same electrical current, so there shouldn't be much of an issue. Yeah, I would, I would think it would be a fairly simple thing is to, uh, is to determine an area and then have a study design. The thing that Davis, California found out that from their, from their failure of their initial study was to have a study design done before they put the lights up. They, 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 they knew who they had to ask. They involved lighting engineers in the, in the process and they made sure that they had sufficient number of people evaluate the lights and to answer the, the right questions. Not just say, do you like it or not, it's saying, you know, do you find, you know, the light is uh, pleasing and all, there's a whole bunch of study design aspects of this too. We just want to have uh, an appropriate study done. Okay, so uh, the town is sort of caught in a little bit in the middle here because uh, they need to raise the lighting standards to some extent. Lakeshore is a fairly major highway through Oakville. Um, uh, perhaps there can be some compromise that on the on the corners, the major intersections, the light tends towards the blue, whilst in between it tends towards the the rosy, uh, orangey, uh, more more, well, more the, home light. Yeah, things. I, Three thousand. I'm not that an expert on on those aspects of it, the safety aspects of it, but I don't think the color of light affects the safety as much as the intensity of the light. So we're talking about. Um, if you have enough of a warm light, but you have enough of it, then you should be able to meet all your safety concerns. And so that's why I think we could be open to uh, and some of the other poll suggestions where you have the arms out on the poles, but as long as the light coming from that, that arm is of a warm color that would be consistent. I think it would look uh, better if all the lights had the same hue as you look down Lakeshore Road. Let's but, agree not to design it by committee tonight. Yes. And, uh, and, uh, and I personally am taking away from this that we should have some spot tests where we, where we check out the different temperatures and see how we feel. I would ask, uh, are you comfortable with the color temperature down there now? Um, I think so. I, I think those acorn lights do have a, a warm uh, glow to them. I, I think we have a, a lovely streetscape. Um, I don't think I've ever thought of them as being, you know, bluish or garish. I, I, I think, but we want to make sure that what's, what's in there is consistent with a lot of the older brick buildings and the, the heritage districts. So whatever is down there now wouldn't offend? No, I, th I, th I think that it, because it is, uh, is it a sodium light now or uh, some of them? Are, I'm not That's sure. high pressure sodium. High pressure sodium, which does have a, a, a lower color temperature. I remember when they came in, everybody hated the color, but never mind. Well, <laughs> compared to what they had, maybe they had something that was, uh, was pretty weak back then. But well, we, we learned to like what we're used yeah. to, I guess. But I appreciate your comments about uh, having the proper study and evaluation. Yeah. yeah, council has always taken special care with the downtown. It's always going to, and, uh, and the... the uh, the reset that, ju that we just conducted this year uh, should prove that if nothing else does. Mm -hmm. So uh, we appreciate very much all of the feedback that we had and uh, thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. 
Mr. Cozy, do you have additional wisdom for us? Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to make a suggestion. Uh, before I do, I think you'll like the suggestion. I think the audience will like the suggestion as well. But let's not forget, we're talking about lighting not just the buildings. We're talking about lighting the, the, the roadway. Lakeshore Road's an arterial roadway with high volumes of traffic. It needs to meet a certain level of lighting. Just wanted to pre-qualify that. My suggestion is the, 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 the struggle we've had with moving forward is we have the bridge project, which is there, we're going to start demolishing the bridge later in January. That bridge has to be lit. We have to put design for lights in that structure. On the structure, you have to hang the lights. You, you just can't put them anywhere you want. You have to build the base for them, and they usually uh, stick out from the side of the parapet walls. Depending on the light that's chosen will depend on what the design is for the bridge. So we're, we're reaching, slowly reaching a point of no return. If, my suggestion is, is if we can go through the public engagement process and select the poll, um, whether it's reusing the existing poll and living with and resolving the issues they have or perhaps providing the exact same poll that was new, that allowed the, 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 uh, uh, the connections. We don't have to deal with the lighting levels at this time. And hear me out. The, what we could do is we could install those lights on the bridge project and we could put in ones with 4K, and we could put in ones with other, other Ks, <laughs> and those will be in service by the autumn of 2017, uh, late autumn. You'll be able to look and enjoy, feel out those poles, test them out for, let's say, the first half of 2018, and then we can make a decision on the lighting levels for the balance. What we'd like to know is what the, what the style of pole is right now, and... Um, I think we could have that pilot project, but we would actually use the, the bridge project as the pilot. We may have to then accept the fact that if, we, if it's something different in terms of the lighting level as we go forward, you might have a different, different type of light or maybe we can retrofit those ones with something else. But there's a suggestion where you could have this test and, and it doesn't slow us down on the bridge project. Well, Mr. Cozy, I was hoping to hear a suggestion that this fall, we do some color temperature testing and get this question uh, settled and done with. And if it was up to me on the poll, I would choose a new version of the old poll so that we were able to have all the conveniences that the BIA requires in order to operate uh, downtown. And I think if we did it that way, it's win, win, win. Uh, I don't know if council feels that way, but but just saying. Yeah, I, I just don't know how quickly we can put these test cases in. I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I can't answer that question right now. We could get uh, a few lamps and uh, I mean bulbs I'm talking about mm -hmm. and test it at Town Square and decide what we like conceivably. Conceivably, yes. I just, I don't, I don't know what's involved in getting from here to there. That's all. I, I need probably a day to get back to you on that. We can give you time. <laughs> I am concerned, though, that I, I don't want, uh, by endless elaboration of uh, the decision, never arrive at a decision and, and not make our target dates for all of the work that we have ahead of us. But, you know, a, a few days, no problem. Yeah, I just, I just like an opportunity to report back, and I can do that via, via email um, and just let you know where, where the next council <coughs> meeting date is, if that's next week. Next council next week? No, we got committees. Mm -hmm. It's a week after. Commissioner. Commissioner to the rescue. I was going to suggest that we will look at the ability for us to uh, give uh, um, the community an opportunity to see the various lighting levels. Um, and we'll see how we can work that into the program that we have that we're bringing forward right now. And when we report back to you on the phase two, we will report back on our investigations on the color side. So I would suggest you leave it with us for some time to see how we can build that into the program so that when we come back, I think it was January, February, we've uh, looked at the color issue um, at that time. And if we need to do a few more samples around town, we can do that in the spring and be done entirely by that point in time. Rather than report back quickly to you with something, just, just give us a little bit more time to uh, sort that through. Done, I believe. Thank you. Yeah. All right, then. Uh, Councillor Elgar. Thank you. Uh, actually, the question is for, for Mr. Cozy. Mr. Cozy, you're saying you need the detailed design for the bridge completed soon. And I'm trying to figure out how you can do it not knowing 
what the lumens are going to be, uh, like because it's going to impact on the spacing of the poles. So what is the minimum light requirements going across the bridge from a, you're saying from a, from the, the type of road it is? What is required? So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try and answer that question by providing an example. Without knowing the, 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 the design standard we're going to implement, we will, we will light the bridge part itself based on standards and we, we so it may be something completely different but the approaches to the bridge where we're doing the streetscape work so from the from the west approach to Forsyth and from the east approach to to Navy uh, we would we would factor in whatever we decide as part of this process through change orders with the contractor and we'll say well we're going with eight poles instead of seven now and and, and, and you know, and we'd negotiate a price. But on the structure itself, we're going to have to make a decision um, by February, because the, the, it'll be tendered. And once they start pouring the deck in the spring, um, this, the rebar has to go in. We we have to know exactly where the lights are going to be. Uh, we're not going to we're not going to go. We can't go past that point. So, I don't think that's critical in this decision process because we're talking about just the bridge. It may be different than the approaches. You don't know how many poles it does. You know, if Unless you go with a tw two point seven the, versus a four. Yeah, the the, the, yes. the 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 lighting level will dictate the spacing. So right. we'll we'll have to assume the tightest spacing on the bridge. But it's but possible. Everyone, let's be clear. Color and brightness are two entirely different things. You can have and lumens goes to brightness, not to color. Uh, we're talking about. I mean, I worked in the film business. I know a little bit about lighting myself. So. Um, the brightness determines the spacing of your poles. The, the color is this other issue. And I guess, um, look, we're, we're going to, I, I think council would be reasonable to give staff uh, uh, one cycle to sort this out and come back to us with, uh, with final recommendations on this, I, I, on, on the brightness and the, and, the, and the hue or the color. We can't let this, and I'm floating it as a balloon, but, but we can't let this drag on forever. Uh, I agree, Mr. Mayor. I, I was you're, just saying you're, that... You're the, describing an expensive way to build a bridge. No, 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 no but I mean, I, I was saying we could, we could pick the shortest possible spacing just for the bridge, just to be conservative, and then we'll have, we may have over-designed the lighting level on the bridge. But at least you, would, you, you wouldn't have to make that change. I'm just trying to provide the opportunity to let the people have a to see these poles work for several months. And, and then we can make that decision, let's say in the spring on the lighting level, because they would be there, they'd see what it would look like in the winter time, they'd see what it looked like in the spring. And then we can make the decision on the actual K of the, of the, of the, of the, of the fixture at that point, because that, that is okay for us to retrofit it into the project. It's just the bridge part. Councillor Hutchins. Well, Mr. Cozy, what? Why, why couldn't we just have the design to the standards you want, have the height with the level you want, because that minimizes the number of poles, but we have the Acon style with the modern, you know, cutting off the light, not letting it for the dark skies, and, and that sort of thing. And then we can change the color temperature of the bulbs so that half the bridge can be 4K, or the other half can be 3K. I'm going to make a suggestion, picking up on what uh, the mayor had said, that we can report back to November the 1st on how we're going to take into consider. that's the next meeting, the next cycle, how we can take into consideration the, the safety standards or the brightness element and how we can take into consideration the color. Um, and so we can bring it back to how we're going to do that, and what opportunities we have for consultation with the public and how we can use uh, pilot projects as an example. So let us do some work and bring you something back on November the 1st. In the road building and illuminating business, there's probably some specified um, correct standard of, of intensity for the at the road, I, I'm imagining. Shake your head, yes or yes. no? Yes. And after that, it's just what color do we want? Uh, by November 1st, you ought to be able to tell us what color it is down there now. 
And if everybody's content with that color, let's make yeah, it that I, color. I'm sure we can get back to you even sooner than November 1st. I just, we, you know, we just need a little bit of time to think about this. All right. This, this, um, we, we've got to stop this dragging on, I think, is my <laughs> sensation about this. All right. Um, thank you, Mr. Cozy and, and Ms. Closey for those suggestions. Uh, Councillor Hutchins, you had indicated that you were prepared to make some kind of motion. I wonder what that might be now. And, and you're always free to ask staff what they would like to suggest is the motion that would capture all of the discussion that we had here. What a great idea. <laughs> so, uh, Ms. Closey, what would you suggest the motion should be reading as, so that it captures the fact that we want to test the street lights on the bridge <coughs> as soon as possible, get a design for it, but we'd also like to, from the intensity point of view, uh, remembering that, that these new lamps can have dimmers on them, so you can change that part, and we'd also like to test the CRI, uh, or the CT, whatever you'd like to color temperature or color rendition temperature, whatever you would like to name, 3,000 Kelvin or 4,000 Kelvin or et cetera. And take your time. <laughs> we, can, we can move on and come back. Yes. Would you like us to move on? I guess we can. So can I suggest something? Uh, that staff can sit, uh, this is recommendation number three or, or the third uh, element in the resolution would be that staff consider specifically the color temperature in the selection process and report back as soon as possible. Good for me. Apparently that's duly moved by Councillor Hutchins. Am I right? I'm right. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed if any? Congratulations, Councillor Hutchins. Your motion is carried. Um, now we come to the, uh, the royal pet grooming business and the larger question of how we deal with the contradictions that have been uncovered between the zoning uh, and the establishments that are on the street in a, at least one section of Spears. And um, uh, Council, you've, you've got three pretty clear uh, choices in front of you. And uh, I think we'll let the planning director review them for you and the public. Uh, through your, your worship to members of the council. So we're here tonight to respond to uh, a request by the Livable Oakville subcommittee, I believe it was at the September 6th meeting, where staff were uh, asked to look into what is necessary to permit the continued operation of a pet grooming business at uh, 1380 Spears Road in the town of Oakville. Uh, so we've had a chance to look into that, and we're back tonight to give you some options and uh, no recommendation. Just a little bit of the history on this property. Um, Mr. Simeone, before you begin, yes. uh, can I ask a, uh, a question to, you know, that you might thread through your presentation? I've heard tonight that there have, that other anomalous businesses have been discovered also on Spears Road uh, with this uh, similar, pro with a similar problem to this. So that changes the dimensions of this, is that correct? It does. All right, away you go. So, thank you, Your Worship. The, um, as I said before, Section 2642 uh, of the Liberal Oakville Plan gives staff uh, some level of direction with respect to undertaking, uh, undertaking a Spears Road corridor study. That's one of the things or themes we're going to talk about tonight. The reason I bring that up is uh, we've just recently completed in draft the Employment Commercial Review, which gave uh, Liberal Oakville Subcommittee and Council an opportunity to consider how employment lands throughout the town of Oakville are, are looked at. In doing, in doing that, certain truths emerge from when we look at uh, the Spears Road corridor. If you look at it from what its plan function is, and by that I mean what its designations are by way of the livable Oakville plan and by the zoning, you will see some variances to what the, uh, what's on the ground from, from a reality standpoint. In other words, not everything always lines up with the planning uh, permissions that reside over the, over the land uses, and so there are some anomalies as we consider Spears Road corridor. With this in mind, uh, we are hopeful to undertake, in accordance with the direction of the uh, Spears Road corridor study, or direction of the Liberal Oakville plan, a study to help us put in context this uh, long linear stretch of, of the town, 
with three distinct sections, one abutting uh, residential to the south. So there's some sensitivities as to how that road is addressed. We need to move traffic. It needs to contribute to the fabric of the community and it needs to remain at some level uh, an employment area. But there seems to be a change that's emerged on that, on that strip of land. So we think that uh, there's a benefit in understanding the context as we go forward. We come back to the property that we were asked to report on. Um, this one has a bit of history. It goes back to about 1997. And uh, specifically at the time it opened operations, it was zoned M1. And the use that the, the property was put to didn't necessarily comply with the bylaw. Again, in 2014, the uh, town of Oakville passed a new zoning bylaw. And again, the use present on the property was not reflected in uses that were permitted in the zoning bylaw. And, and as you've uh, mentioned, Your Worship, this is not uncommon, although it's not the norm, but it's not uncommon as we consider the Spears Road corridor study. So again, back to uh, the direction to staff. We were asked to look at what, what are options. And I think if you look in the report, you'll see three straightforward options that, that could occur. Essentially, one and two of them are essentially the same, that the owner of the property could proceed uh, site-specifically with an owner-initiated official plan amendment and site-specific zoning to, to permit the use as it currently exists in that location. Another option would be for the town to proceed on that basis, where in, in this case the town effectively would in initiate the site-specific official plan amendment and necessary zoning amendments to, to reflect the per that permitted use on that site. And then there's a third option, which allows uh, context to be considered, and that would be the uh, wait, the finalization of the Spears Road corridor study, which is about to commence. We have the direction again in the Livable Oakville plan, and we could proceed to, to uh, consider this property and all others on Spears Road that may share the same characteristics and have a, um, the proper contextual uh, sort of analysis piece for us to uh, make proper recommendations to, to, to town council. I think that covers it, Your Worship. All right, thank you very much. Um, Council, um, I have an interest in, I mean, I'm concerned about this and I have uh, uh, spoken with members of the public about this and, uh, and so I would like to participate in the discussion and debate on this and I would like to pass the chair to Councillor O'Meara who is the uh, next available acting mayor. And Councilor O'Meara, I wonder if you would be so kind as to accept this, this swap. No problem, my pleasure. Uh, do you want to stay there? Or do you want me here, or what do you want? Well, with that, um, thank you, Worship. Is there anyone who wishes to speak to the issue? I'm looking at uh, <laughs> Mayor Burton. Thank you, Mr. Acting Mayor. Um, Council, um, I, um, uh, I would like to first ask the Planning Director if there's any reason uh, for us not to do the second option, which is the Council-initiated uh, site-specific uh, uh, zone. The, the, the Business reference there is um, in a bit of hardship in that they, um, the the proprietor is, is um, how this came to light was the proprietor was uh, engaged in selling her business, and the prospective buyer checked with the town to uh, see if it was a permitted business, which is a, a due diligence thing that any prospective buyer would do, and that's how it was discovered that this didn't fit the zoning, and so. I'm concerned, uh, Mr. Planning Director, uh, as to how long it would take to do this corridor study and, uh, and the fact that I, I, I think we would be asking the proprietor to endure rather a longer wait than, than I really think would be a kind thing. It wouldn't be, I don't think it'd be kind and, and it's kind of harmful to, to the proprietor. So um, would you speak to uh, any downside to us proceeding uh, with option two and uh, first and second would you describe for us if we went with the third option how long it would take uh, thank you to you mr. chair to his worship um, there is no technical reason why staff cannot proceed to undertake a town initiated review if directed so by town council that's that's not an issue 
Uh, I've been asked to describe what the downsides are, so I would uh, put forward the notion that we're considering uh, dealing with the change of use in the context of, a, of an employment area, and uh, there's issues of potentially of employment conversion and how that may be seen or not seen as a precedent-setting issue as we go forward. Um, and we would like the benefit in, we can still deal with that application on a site-specific basis. The, um, the downside is we don't often have the benefit of all the information we may acquire, and I know we will acquire and accumulate through the, uh, a broader study. So I, I do believe that there's um, uh, a lack of context that, that, it, that represents itself with this option. But all options as we present it are doable. Thank you very much for that. Uh, that's helpful to me. Uh, Mr. Acting Mayor, if I'm in order to do it, I would like to move that Council uh, adopt option two, the uh, Council-initiated uh, site-specific change. We can do that. Thank you for the motion. Is there any other comments on here? I've got uh, Councillor Lapworth. Thank you, Mr. Acting Mayor. <clears throat> the Oakville and Milton Humane Society have recently been negotiating with the town of Milton to have a satellite office in, in the town of Milton. Mm -hmm. But the issue that was raised there is that unless we are a medical facility, okay, we would not be permitted to leave the animals on site overnight. And I'm concerned here if this grooming facility or grooming facilities okay, would be required to keep animals overnight on the premises. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. To the councillor. It's my understanding this is not that type of facility. That would be more of a, a, a veterinarian's clinic or some, something of that nature where animals are brought in under distress and they're needed to stay overnight. This is simply a place to, as I understand it, to have a dog groomed, wash it, clip its nails, clip its hair, things of that nature. I assume picked up, dropped off in the morning, picked up at the end of the day or shortly in that time frame somehow. Okay. Thank you very much. Just wanted to be sure on that point. Uh, thank you. We've got uh, Councillor Elgar and Councillor Adams next. Uh, I thank you very much. Uh, my question would be, uh, can you just remind me what precedent could this set going forward if, in fact, we go with option two? Um, well, yeah. Okay, so through your, Mr. Chair, sorry. The, um, the, the, I haven't given you a, a staff position on it yet. We have, actually haven't done it, but there, there's a potential that staff may oppose the application. So there's an issue that resides with that. Um, there's an issue of regional plan conformity that we have to concern ourselves with. We would circulate this application to the region. Um, they would provide commentary. I'm thinking it's of, of, a, of a, such a minor local nature that perhaps there would be a way forward, but it's unclear to me at this time if that's the outcome, so we run that risk. Um, there are a number of other property owners that I'm aware of that we have dealt with in the context of the new zoning bylaw and potential settlements. And uh, we may be um, not proceeding in the same fashion as we had before. And there are another, other landowners who may see this as a signal to file individual applications. So again, it's messaging. Uh, my comments about the study, it allows, it puts everybody in the same sort of place and it gives the same treatment and the same uh, opportunity for context without uh, signaling that the town is making a, you know, a different decision about land uses in this part of the community. So can you remind me, how long would the study take? Because doing one thing here, which I think a lot of us would agree with, but could set one heck of a precedent-setting case for everyone that isn't in compliance now also. The, time, the study is actually good to you. Uh, it's a good question. It was presented to Liberal Oakville this afternoon. I'm trying to call up the slide in my head. I believe it takes us into the end of 2017. I'm looking at uh, Gabe and... Jane, to see if they recall anything different on that. I believe that's the time frame we're, we're looking at. We're looking at at least a year to complete that study. There's a whole design piece that we're looking at, can, uh, looking, undertaking an assessment of what's there on the ground now versus what's permitted to be on the ground right now, and then the you know, whole public process that we'd have to work ourse walk ourselves through. How many businesses are we talking that really are not in compliance now? I don't Do you have think that. you have a ballpark? Like, is it one? Is it two? Is it ten? Is it fifteen? I, I wouldn't venture a guess. I so don't have that information. We don't have that information no, at all at this point. Something we would have to determine as we went forward. I, so I thank you very much for that. Uh, based on that information, if option two is what's put forth, I cannot support it because I think it's very could be potentially very precedent setting. I thank you, Councillor Adams. 
I also don't think I can support option two. Uh, can you tell, if I understand it correctly, there's also a foregoing of fees that would otherwise be paid by the private sector, is that correct? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, the options as I understand them, that the town, if the owner applies, then they would, my understanding is they'd be paying for the application fees. If the town's initiating it, it was my understanding that the fees would not be applied. Right, but we'd be doing the work for them. That's correct. And so if there are others in the area that are in a similar position, we could have a situation where we'd have others coming forward and saying us too. I'm, Which we'd I, have to deal with on a case-by-case -case basis. Could, that could present itself to this council so for that decision. So for the reasons that Councillor Elgar has outlined, as, uh, as well as the discussion that's happened tonight, I can't support the, the motion. Are there, Mayor Burton? Uh, the ward councillors and I are aware of a second case, so there's only two known to us. And to, um, and in the interest of uh, full disclosure, uh, the ward councillor uh, who isn't here uh, has uh, told me that she supports option three, which is consistent with what uh, councillors Elgar and Adams have been saying. Uh, but uh, I believe that we have a hardship case here and that it's a minor one. And so I, I felt it was necessary to put forward option two on behalf of the uh, proprietor. Uh, any other comments, Council Lucina? Mr. Samayoni, how long would a site plan take uh, for option two? A site, through you, Mr. Chair, a site specific zoning and official plan, I'm going to estimate nine months. Am I off on that? Nine months, I can't see it quicker than that time frame, six maybe, but I, I don't think so. So very similar to the third option. It would be in perhaps a little bit shorter, there's no question about that. Because so once we had the information, we could slot it for an agenda. The study will take as long as it takes. But the time would be close. But I still think the option two would be the quicker one. Thank you. Um, Councillor Noel. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, with respect to option three, it, the, the wording of this uh, uh, option states that um, the owner could await the finalization of the Spears Road corridor study and then determine at that time what the appropriate steps would be to legalize the peckering business. So um, if I understood what you said correctly, the finalization of the report would be at the end of 2017. Yes. So at that point, then a determination would be made as to what to do. The, the, the road corridor study would not in and of itself resolve the issue. No, so let me just be clear through you, Mr. Chair, to the Councillor. So we would go through the study process and certain truths would emerge and there would be directions uh, that staff would be uh, sharing with Council and the community about where policies might evolve. And then there would be a series of recommendations. In my mind, coming forward at some point, these may be in the form of official plan amendments to larger geographies than just one. We might say, you know, this block here, really has migrated to this for this reason. It makes sense to consider potentially some changes, potentially some zoning uh, changes that would flow from that. So their implementation phase would, once the reports were done, we'd still have OPA and potential zoning to, to implement as well. So in, in, in effect, that, that there is a big gulf between the eight months, seven to eight months to do a town initiated uh, rezoning or uh, OPA and the Spears Road Corridor because the Spears Road Corridor process so item three wouldn't even start until the, the, the report is presented, is what I understand. So it's at least, it would be at least well into 2018 before this would ever see a council vote. Through you, Mr. Chair. It has the potential to achieve that uh, on, on the large study. Yes, it does. But in term, I understand that. But the timing... The timing when is, that, I agree with your, your timing. So we would be looking at 2017, the end of 2017 to complete the corridor study. And then whatever the outflow is from that, it would take... The, eight months the to time it takes to implement yes right okay do we have any uh, any other comments councillor Giddings thank you I understand the concerns with uh, the motion that's on the table in terms of the third await finalization of Spears Road would this be a case where we have a non-legal non-conforming or whatever the phrase would be. I'm just wondering what our enforcement people are going to be doing in the meantime. Through you, Mr. Chair, I'm not uh, an enforcement person. I understand the commissioner may have some comments on that one. 
Uh, I did speak to the new director of municipal bylaw enforcement on this issue, and he indicated that where there is a study underway or someone has made an application, uh, they customarily await for those things to be settled out before they proceed with uh, finalizing any of the investigation on those sites. I appreciate that, and it sounds like a fair and prudent way to move forward. If there were other businesses on Spears as well, they would have a buy at the same time because they would be in the same circumstance, I would think. Yes, they'd take the same, uh, through you, Mr. Acting Mayor, they would take the same approach uh, for this specific site as well as other sites that would be in the study area. Thanks. Councillor Chisholm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm in um, looking at uh, option three is the, the appropriate uh, position that I think we should take. With respect to the dog grooming, I think this is what has happened. It's just rearing, rearing one um, possibility and there's others to follow. And I really believe let's to be organized on this and the, the Spears Road corridor is, is the best solution in order to bring this to uh, fruition in 2017 and 2018 for implementation, whatever that it gives. It gives the opportunity of the, the businesses to make their decisions and what they're going to do is knowing this is coming down um, and keeping them apprised of, of the, the status and process of this uh, study will hopefully uh, clarify um, the zoning and where they should be or where they not should be. So I'm supporting uh, number three, the option three. <clears throat> Council Lucina. Mr. Simeone, can you comment then on the ability of the proprietor to sell the property right now if this study is happening in 2017 with the non-conforming uh, language there? Hear you, Mr. Chair. I'm not. I'm not a, a solicitor, but I can only say that properties can be bought and sold regardless of zoning. I'm not sure. I don't believe this person is the actual owner. I think they're a tenant in the facility. So again, I'm not uh, clear. I'm not. It's not clear to me um, that they own the whole building. This is a, a like a strip mall, if you think about it. And this is one of the uh, tenants that you would drive up. There's there's more than one. There's a number of. Uh, units in this building. Well, the reason I ask is the mayor had indicated that there was hardship issues here. Would you like to clarify that? Please. Well, it, well it's a lucky thing. Mayor Burton's next on the roll here. He might be able to answer you. Uh, the, the proprietor's a tenant and uh, the, the intention of, of the motion is to uh, basically fix her the spot that she's in not the entire strip mall and uh, it would provide her the ability to sell the business and the and the and if she can find a buyer at this point the buyer would be able to operate it where it is which is where the customers are used to finding it and a lot of these small businesses the much of the value of the business is the is the customer list so uh, uh, as I say uh, it's a, a, I mean, council in its wisdom will, will make whatever is the best decision for the town, but I, uh, having been involved in, in discovering the, the dimensions of the problem, I, I felt a duty to bring forward uh, the motion I brought forward. Uh, do we have any other comments then? So at this point I have uh, a motion on the table from Mayor Burton, uh, the motion. Oh, my apologies. Are there any members from the public here who uh, have any information they would like to bring forward on this issue? Going once, twice, thrice. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so I do have I do have a motion on the floor. The motion is um, a to receive the report and also to direct staff to proceed uh, with the second option, the town initiated regional OPA town OPA and zoning bylaw amendment. Uh, so I'll call uh, I'll call the vote. All in favor of the motion. And those opposed, the motion fails. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, Councillor Chisholm. Yes, can we uh, put another motion on the floor here? Do whatever Mr. you Chair? would like. Thank Councilor. you. Uh, just give me a second here. Staff be directed to initiate the Spears Road corridor study. 
as identified in section 26.4.2 of the livable Oakville plan, which states the corridor located along Spears Road should be further studied to confirm long-term land uses and opportunities for intensification suitable for this area. Um, so that's a bit of a mouthful. Are you, are you asking for option number three? Then, yes. Or you're asking for something different? Option, yes, so we're talking motions and options. So option, th um, option three with the addition of this statement. As uh, if, you, if you call it a motion, I guess. Okay, I, I can, if you can bring it up sure. here for me, because I'd, I'd, I'd like to read out. Um, so we have here that staff be directed to initiate the Spears Road corridor study as identified in section 26.4.2 of the Livable Oakville Plan, which states the corridor located along Spears Road should be further studied to confirm the long-term uses um, for intensification suitable for this area. Um, that's the motion. Just for clarification, are we not already, have we not already initiated that study or is that not on the docket? We haven't started it yet. Okay. So that would be start, yeah. Okay. Um, is our colleagues comfortable? Would they want to want to see this or? Okay, um, okay, well, we heard it, perfect. So, uh, Councillor Adams. Can staff just confirm what this motion does for them or means to them in terms of their action? How is it different than uh, just awaiting the finalization of the Spears Road Corridor study? Um, not much different to you, Mr. Chair. It does give uh, sort of the, the authority of where we're coming from, from the Livable Oakville, so we're providing that sense, and then some of the call them terms of reference of the study. So we've identified, and I believe in that motion, talks about future land uses and, and, and this type of thing. So it gives a little bit of clarity in terms of what the expectations Is are. Is that not already within the expectations of the Spears Road Corridor Study? The Spears Road Corridor Study, as it exists in Livable Oakville, is a one-line sentence that says to, uh, which is quoted in the motion. So we've chose to repeat it to make sure that it, it's clear. It's clear. Right, it, only in as much as everything that was said is what I would have expected this study to do and so I'm yeah. wondering I just wanted to know why we were including well, it. I have no problem with we it. We thought it was a good idea to make sure that the actual words of Livable Oakville and which council's intent were reflected in the study so there was clarity in terms of what we were about to do. Okay so we're just being really clear to you about what we're doing. Okay yes. I'm good. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Burton. Uh, I just want to call attention to the fact that the the councillor also moved receipt of the report and that I don't want that to get lost. Thank you. Noted. Uh, any other comments on uh, this motion that's uh, before us at the table? Then I will call the vote on this motion. All in favor? And opposed? Motion carries. Mayor Burton, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. I, I appreciate uh, very much that uh, full and fair consideration was given to my proposal, and uh, and I was uh, I appreciated uh, seeing what Council's direction was, and and uh, I'll just call attention to the fact that I, I then turned around and, and voted with Council on Council's preferred direction. Um, next, we have item number six: the Province of Ontario Coordinated Land Use Planning Review. And you had a a big addendum distributed to you. And if you give your attention now to Mr. Bigger, I think it's important that the public understand what we're dealing with here as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Good evening. This uh, item before you is number six on your agenda. And I'll just give you a bit of an outline of what we're gonna try and achieve this evening. We're gonna uh, present a, a summary of the coordinated plan review and the the process of that review and the level of participation from the Town of Oakville. We'll go through some of the proposed changes to the relevant plans. We're going to highlight some areas of concern and some recommendations that we're giving to the province through this process. Uh, we're going to put some emphasis on some key additional recommendations uh, that are uh, really important to the Town of Oakville and uh, leave some time for some questions at the end. So the Coordinated Land Use Planning Review is a provincial initiative and uh, a lot of the work that we do here in this chamber results from the planning documents that, that the province sets up for us. 
Uh, the provincial plan review was initiated in February 2015, and it's been the subject of uh, extensive consultation and feedback. The four plans that are under review are the, the uh, Niagara Scarpman plan, the Oak Ridges Moraine plan, the Greenbelt plan, and the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, as we call the, the, uh, the growth plan. And uh, the, the years that those plans came into effect are also indicated on the slide. The Greenbelt plan and the growth plan being the two newest plans uh, that we're dealing with here in Oakville. Uh, after all the consultation and feedback, the province released, and we, we participated in that whole process as well. Um, so we participate uh, at every opportunity here at the town of Oakville. And in May 2016, the province released proposed changes to the four plans. And uh, we've been reviewing those as a group and individually and uh, with our colleagues and various other agencies and uh, with work with council and subcommittee. Uh, and we have a, a series of comments prepared and the deadline for those comments in this process is October 31st of this year, so this month. That, that uh, initially uh, was set for the end of September, but our schedule is such that we were able to come to see you first before our commenting deadline, and that's been important for, to get this sort of input along the way. So just a quick overview, uh, and some of you have, have seen this, uh, so I won't dwell on it, but the, uh, the proposed changes to the plans, essentially the vision for complete communities, uh, curbing sprawl, protecting the natural environment, managing growth, those directions in those plans are confirmed, refined, and strengthened through the proposed changes. And generally, uh, that's a good direction. However, there are concerns, as we'll, as we'll get to. Uh, part of the approach here is to introduce some new concepts to these plans. Uh, there's an area where we're seeing the, the responsibilities for upper and single tier governments enhanced, those responsibilities. Uh, some of the changes are quite subtle but significant, and uh, some long-standing matters remain unresolved. Uh, and we'll, again, we'll touch on some of these examples on the way through. There's a lot of material and we won't get to it tonight. We can have some questions and, and a lot of the reports covered in greater detail. And there's also a level of uncertainty that's been introduced through uh, these proposed changes and, and questions around implementation of the plans. Uh, just to help keep things a bit simple for us, there were only two plans that apply to Oakville of the four that are under review. And the Greenbelt Plan is one from 2005 and the Growth Plan is the second from 2006. Uh, the Greenbelt Plan is indicated here in the, uh, the green area and the area in sort of this buff color, I hope you can see it on your monitors, is the, the growth plan area. And there's the inner ring, which includes Halton and Oakville, and the outer ring, which includes these areas to the outside of, of um, the Greenbelt plan. And really this area is the, obviously the area of concern to us, and it's an area uh, facing tremendous growth and development pressure. I'm going to start with the Greenbelt Plan, uh, and this is a made in Oakville good news story. Uh, what we're seeing on this slide is two images. This is the Greenbelt Plan from our, the, the uh, livable Oakville plan shows the Greenbelt Plan in this, essentially this hatched area. Um, and that's the Greenbelt Plan that was adopted in 2005, and that's the Greenbelt Plan that we show in, in uh, livable Oakville plan. And, uh, in, the, in 2008 to 2012, the province undertook a process called Growing the Greenbelt, and that was to identify ways and areas, locations, where perhaps the Greenbelt plan could be expanded. And uh, this council and staff were quite involved in that process. Uh, ultimately, that process resulted in the creation of a new designation in the Greenbelt plan, and that's called the Urban River Valley designation. And amendment number one to the Greenbelt plan introduced, amended the Greenbelt Plan to include that designation and applied this designation to lands in Oakville. Uh, so that was ultimately the result of, of growing the Greenbelt. And what's indicated here on the second image is the Glen Orkey Preserve, which is located up here in the lands north of Dundas, south of the 407 along 16 Mile Creek. The Urban River Valley designation was applied to the Glen Orkey Preserve as a result of um, our work and our involvement in growing the Greenbelt. Uh, it's a, it's, so that's a, a good news story for Oakville. Uh, moving ahead to 2016 with the proposed changes to the Greenbelt Plan, 
We have uh, this Urban River Valley designation identified in the Greenbelt Plan area to be designated to 21 urban river valleys, three of which are located in Oakville, and specifically that 16 Mile Creek, 14 Mile Creek, and Bronte Creek. Uh, so again, this is still continuing on that theme of growing the Greenbelt, which is something we are supportive of and have been supportive of. Uh, but we do have some, some recommendations for the province on growing the Greenbelt. Uh, and we're essentially suggesting, and you can kind of see this here, the, the mapping for growing the Greenbelt along these urban river valleys in Oakville. Uh, 14 Mile Creek is only shown to have the urban river valley designation down to the QEW. And so one of our requests or recommendations to the province is to is extend that along the entire length of 14 Mile Creek River Valley down to Lake Ontario, which would be consistent with the, the application of the urban river valley and other valleys throughout the plan area. So that's one area where we think that there could be an improvement. Uh, we also think that, and that's just, just saying, you know, to be consistent with your approach in this designation. Uh, we're not, the, the mapping to generate this designation at a finer scale is really just a buffer that's been applied to the natural feature. And, and we feel that that type of mapping for what it means locally could be improved through the use of local mapping. So the actual limits of the natural features or the natural hazards aren't reflected in that buffer necessarily. And so another recommendation we would have to the province is to use our local mapping. And this is another example or an example of where in keeping the local municipality involved at the, in these discussions at the provincial level and the regional level will create a, a, a more, I guess, um, uh, a more thorough, a more robust planning type process. And then, um, that's all I'm going to say about natural, about the urban river valleys, pardon me. So it generally it's, uh, we're, uh, we feel positive about it and we think that uh, it's almost there and it could go a little bit farther. So moving on to the growth plan, just a, a little bit on how it works. Uh, the, the notion of forecasts are, are the, sort of the first step in the growth plan and a forecast is an estimate uh, of future growth uh, in terms of population employment as it would come into an area. Uh, it's a number of people and jobs that is expected to be coming here. And then how those forecasts are allocated and where they, they're put uh, is done through targets. And so we use uh, in, in the growth plan, there are a number of targets that are used. So Midtown Oakville is designated an urban growth center and it has a target of 200 residents and jobs per hectare. That's a density target. Uh, there's another one that's called an intensification target. And currently in Oakville for the lands south of Highway 5, essentially Dundas, we consider that our built up area. And currently we are required under the growth plan to provide 40% of all new units within the built boundary. And that's measured regionally, but for Oakville purposes, it would be south of Dundas. Uh, that proposed change in the, in the growth plan is to take that number of 40% up to 60%. So within that same boundary, the built up area of Halton and for Oakville, it's south of Dundas, 60% of all units built annually would be required to be built within that boundary. So that's our intensifi minimum intensification target. And another one that's of interest or concern is a designated greenfield area. And currently we're required to provide uh, 50 residents and jobs combined per hectare. And that's for the lands outside of the built up area. So the greenfield area. Uh, that number is proposed to change to 80 from 50. There's a different way of calculating how you get to 80. But again, it's, it's ratcheting up the level of intensification in these different types of areas. <coughs> So that's just a, uh, hopefully a bit of an overview over that and certainly we can come back to it. Uh, there's concern around that uh, because we have areas that are planned at a certain level of density. What does it mean in terms of implementation? Are we going to have to go back and replan those areas or will those areas be, uh, will we look at, at areas outside of the area that we've planned to or the time horizon that we've planned to? So currently the livable Oakville plan and the, and the growth plan uh, is planned to 2031. The proposed changes are going to take us to 2041, and so do we have to reopen all that work and replan these areas that are already developing, or can we implement the new numbers after the time period on the lands that aren't planned in such a way? So those are our recommendations to the province. 
uh, that we should phase it in in 2031. This is the um, intensification target inside the built boundary. Uh, and that it should be measured from 2031 to 2041. So let us do, let us do the implementation of the plans that we have in place and let's in introduce those new targets in the future. Same goes for the 80 residents and jobs per hectare, uh, the designated greenfield area target. Those should be applied to lands that are unplanned in the greenfield area. And for Oakville, we are, are fully planned. We're fully urban. Uh, so it's less a concern for us, but were we, were we required to go back and replan those areas, that would be a major concern for us. So there's some uncertainty around how we will transition and how we'll be required to implement these new uh, targets. Funding. So uh, this has emerged from the day the growth plan was initiated uh, back in 2006. How are we going to pay for all this required growth and the intensification to support this required growth? And so uh, that continues to be a very, very strong theme and, and a, a chorus of voices across uh, the region uh, that in order for municipalities to uh, provide infrastructure for growth, you need stable, sustainable uh, type funding for that. Uh, so we've, we've identified two types of funding that, that we would recommend the province provide. One is they should pay for some infrastructure to support the growth that we're required to accommodate. And they should also provide for uh, new tools, new funding tools uh, to local municipalities so that we can also uh, pay for growth uh, and have growth pay for itself fully. Currently, the, the development charges in the current um, tax base can't provide the required infrastructure funding to support the growth. And then thirdly, uh, one of the unresolved issues perhaps or a, a, a constant issue is that we should all be I'll put, to put it gently, we should all be in the same boat rowing together in the same direction. And sometimes you get different ministries going off in different directions. Uh, and so we think that all ministries should be coordinated and they should be co coordinated through some type of provincial secretariat so that um, the left hand and the right hand are working together and that would flow down through all the other uh, municipalities involved with implementing the growth plan. And that would go to delivery of infrastructure, hospitals, schools, pipes, wires, roads, all these things that you need uh, to improve in order to have more people using them. So there have been some changes to employment policy and this is a little bit in the subtle but significant category of changes in the growth plan. The definition of major office has changed uh, to include smaller buildings and uh, Whereas now a major office might be, let's say, something the size of town hall. Today, under the, or in the proposed growth plan, it would be something half the size of town hall. So you find these types of buildings in more locations. And what they're saying uh, in these proposed changes is that major office should be directed to growth areas. So midtown Oakville or intensification, other intensification nodes or corridors. Whereas in Oakville, where we have a very strong office market, we'd like to be able to put offices where we want to put offices. Uh, and so there's a concern there for us with, the, with this new definition of, of major office. There's also another, um, another concept that's been introduced called prime employment areas. And it, it essentially is describing land intensive, warehouse, industrial type of uses. And uh, these are important uses in an economic sense, but they may not be the type of of uses that we would define for some of our employment areas. And so um, we, we are supportive generally of, of protecting employment lands and of these changes in the employment policies, uh, but that we would, we would again recommend that the province look to local talent, if you will, the local municipal authority and their teams to give them the information around what should go where and what uses should be permitted and what are the locations for these, these important economic drivers. Um, it's the theme that's risen up through some of the other reporting is, you know, it, it's a one-size-fits-all planning approach and really uh, there's a lot of local character and identity that could be lost in, if it's not considered and if the local um, planning authority is not involved in, in that planning process. So we're, again, we're asking for uh, recognizing that local authority and, and, um, and providing clarity on how to implement this. <coughs> So climate change is, a, uh, is an important new theme. The word climate doesn't even appear in the current growth plan, and now it's appearing in every provincial document. And we think this is a good thing. It's, a, it's, uh, it's an important issue. 
on a global scale, uh, it's an important issue for Oakville, and Oakville has been a leader in climate change policy and, and implementation or activity at the municipal level for many years. Long before some of the other people were getting into it, Oakville was leading the way. Uh, so uh, it's great to say it, but we don't know what to do with it. And so um, we need some more clarity and some more guidance on how to implement climate change policy in, in a land use document. So that's one of the recommendations we're making to the province. Um, and, and this is back to that upper tier, lower tier, uh, or upper tier and single tier power. Um, in terms of being able to be, be um, writing official plan policy at the local level, we can still do that in our OPs, but we won't have the protection of the provincial policy uh, growth plan saying you can write OP policy. So we think that, again, this is a, a specific kind of adjustment. It should be the, the, the opportunity to put in, in your official plan policies for climate change should be for all municipalities, not just upper and single tier. And then finally, there are ways other than the official plan or the growth plan to combat climate change. And so we're suggesting that extra tools be developed, uh, such as amendments to the building code. Uh, buildings are emitters. And so the building code could be a, a really strong instrument in, in, uh, in helping implement climate change action. So this is the last point. Uh, there's two slides. The, before the recommendation, uh, uh, an area of, of um, great interest and concern for the town of Oakville is this notion of a municipal comprehensive review. And it's a, it's a concept that exists in the current growth plan and it carries forward into the proposed growth plan. Uh, but we feel again that some of the way it's being used and who's able to use it isn't quite giving Oakville what it needs in order to plan locally. Um, for example, uh, the, in order to set your urban boundary and to establish nodes and corridors, you need to do a municipal comprehensive review. Um, in order to change those things, you need to, to undertake a municipal comprehensive review. And you can't submit a private application to make those changes. The municipal authority is the one that initiates the review and implements the actions of that review. So there's a restriction against private applications. Um, Private applications, that's for urban boundary expansion, for example. We don't have that problem here in Oakville. We're dealing with, with other situations. And, and uh, private applications that would change the urban structure of a municipality aren't restricted in the same way as a boundary expansion. So we think this is a, this is a gap. And it's an important gap for Oakville because that's a type of challenge we're facing in our planning environment and to our planning framework. So, even though you need to do an MCR to create a structure, someone can come along and change that structure and there's no restriction against that. So we think that uh, private amendments to change a local municipal official plan uh, and a growth structure should be sheltered or, or restricted. You shouldn't be able to submit private applications. So here are the recommendations that restrictions be placed on the initiation of private OPAs and large-scale proposals to uh, change the urban structure. And then uh, that would give us the opportunity to, uh, and, and the strength to plan and finance and service growth. So that's the fallout from a change to your structure is you haven't been going down that path. The path changes and all the, the whole uh, municipal direction has to change to follow that. Um, and that's not fair, essentially. It's not appropriate. So that's our point about uh, this. The, the municipal comprehensive review, review is used in many ways through the growth plan, but this is a, a key point for us. So this is a report recommendation uh, that the report be endorsed by council. And we're, we're using endorsed here because we want, to, we want support to send this off as our comments to the province. Uh, we're also looking for direction to circulate this report to our municipal partners in Halton, which is City of Burlington, Town of Halton Hills, Town of Malt Milton, excuse me, not Malton, <laughs> and the region of Halton, as well our Halton MPPs we'd like to circulate this report to, and the Natural Resources and Forestry. They're a partner agency, partner ministry in uh, the Greenbelt Plan, the Growth Plan. And then finally, we'd like uh, direction to submit this report to the province's comments from the Town of Oakville prior to the deadline of October 31st. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for a very clear explanation 
um, of a very complex and uh, difficult subject, and I think the public was very well served by the clarity of that. I really appreciate that. I already have notice of questions from Councillor Elgar. Are there others? Councillor O'Meara. Councillor Elgar, you have the floor. I thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I, I appreciate the presentation. I wondered if they could give a little more clarification on the urban river valley system. It, it sounds really good with, with what you presented. So I'm not aware that it applies to the private lands, just the publicly owned lands. So how far did the province go on that? So the, the province hasn't made any changes to the, the ownership of land that the urban river valley designation is applied to. So it applies only to the publicly owned land. That's correct. It, it, today, it, 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 the current plan applies it just to publicly owned, as does the proposed growth, uh, Greenbelt plan. Right. They t didn't take the next step at all. No. They just stayed right out of the water. Yes. You mentioned about ministries are differing. Can you expand a little bit more where the ministries are differing on everything, on the numbers? Uh, perhaps through you, Mr. Chair, the numbers, uh, some growth numbers or population forecasts? Or Gabe, you said that it seems to be that the ministries are differing at this point in time. I just wonder if you can kind of uh, just I think when you were speaking that. about the delivery of growth supporting services, hospitals, schools, pipes and roads. Yeah, so uh, I, I won't speak about numbers and differing in numbers, but an example of where there, were, there perhaps was an alignment was you have a growth plan that is saying uh, Midtown Oakville is a designated urban growth center and it's to accommodate uh, a lot of mixed use, residential, office, retail type development. And another ministry builds a parking garage on a key location in what would be a growth center. So that kind of alignment or misalignment is the sort of thing we would like to um, avoid uh, through better cooperation at the ministerial level. Uh, funding is another one. I think where where things go based on money versus where things go based on land use policy sometimes don't line up. So that kind of... I, I appreciate the, a little more clarification. Now, today at the um, Livable Oakville subcommittee uh, meeting, I raised a, a, an issue when it started, some of the OMB reports and some of the uh, legal, legal people representing developers have made it abundantly clear that they're there's no requirement or standard in the pro provincial plan that says that proposals of a certain size may not proceed as individual applications and that they must not be considered only through a town-led process. I, I, I wonder if has staff had time to see whether we can uh, put a little more wording into one section of the proposal that we're looking at sending? Councillor, that's exactly what that MCR slide was talking about. That's That's... I, I get it, exactly. but I'm just wondering, I, my question was to staff to ask them if they had any time to put additional wording and to make it even clearer. Through you, Worship, to Councillor Algar. Yeah, we did um, look at it, and I think Kirk tried to cover in his presentation, and it's covered on, um, it's item six, page 17 of um, the addendum agenda. I think to ensure we protect the urban structure that we, as a municipality, establishes through a comprehensive review, I would suggest that we could add something um, to the third paragraph to say further official plan amendments that result from municipal comprehensive review should be sheltered from appeals. I thank you for that. I just want complete clarity as we go forward, so I appreciate the extra wording if we could go with that, if that's okay. Um, that's all the questions I have. I, there was a lot of 97 pages to read, and I, I did read them all, and uh, I, I did note that you also got the modifications that were made at the region uh, recently at, at the, so I, I appreciate that they were in there. So thank you very much. Councillor O'Meara. Thank you very much, uh, through you, Your Worship. Um, thank you very much, staff, for the detailed report. It was, um, it's good, and I know, I know working regionally, we're, we're seeing um, a similar vein. I have concerns with regards to the term that we keep going back to in terms of financial tools. Uh, we kind of had a bit of a brinksmanship showdown at AMO where the Premier said, well, tell me what you want, and I want it clear. Uh, and it seems to me like we're heading down a path where we know development isn't paying for uh, development at 100%. We have the province mandating that we need to take more, um, but yet we seem to be 
uh, not taking, in my opinion, a firm enough stance that, okay, but you're going to fund this and you're going to step up to it. And I, th I think what, um, what I'm seeing down the road is um, some sort of taxation tools that are going to be put on to the municipalities to levy in order to pay for a mandate that we're, we've been given from the province. And I'm wondering if there's not some sort of stronger language we could use to ensure that um, you know, the province takes the needed steps to provide the total funding to meet its mandate for municipalities to provide complete communities to meet the needs for people in daily living, those sorts of things. Just, I have hesitations about asking for, um, for financial tools uh, to do that when it's the province itself that's making us do that. And I would like uh, uh, to be very clear in our language that we expect them to pay for the development that they're thrusting upon us and not have us throw ourselves out and, and go to our residents and ask them for new taxation tools. Uh, um, so I'm wondering maybe if you can comment on that. Maybe I'm misreading that that sentence, but uh, I'm not sure if, if, if I'm at a line here in terms of my council colleagues, but that was sort of raising flags to me. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I would I would say that uh, the, if there's an opportunity for stronger language, we should use it. But the um, what we attempted to craft in the recommendation was a balance uh, that the province should be paying for some things. We if we would like if the province and then we would like the opportunity to pay for some things ourselves or to generate the revenue to pay for those things. If the province gave us all the money, they, they wouldn't let us tell them how to spend it either. Perhaps so there's a risk if. You don't have some of the money. You might not be able to implement what you what your ambitions are. So that's just a it, a way of having both. Perhaps is what we're aiming for. Yeah. Well, I guess just to clarify, we're we're not getting the money. Our residents are. It's their money. So I I and I know a dollar of tax dollar is a dollar to most residents. They don't really see where it is and where it comes from. But. I'm hypersensitive to that, and and I know our residents are even more hypersensitive to that. So um, when when we tell them that we need uh, to pay for more buses and we need to do a bunch of other things that, in one way, shape, or form, uh, the buses was the wrong one because I know there's been some changes there. But um, you know, I, I I think I would like the province to know that we still feel the responsibility is on them if they're forcing development and growth on us to make sure that that's paid for uh, and not just allow us to be the the sort of the straw figures up there who. Okay, well, if you want to go tax them, go put a land tax land transfer tax on, and have our residents be up in arms, even though the province is the one mandating us to grow these areas. So I, I, I would like to see um, this land squarely on the province's lap, so that when it happens, we can turn around and said, we asked for this, we told them that this was on there, and 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 uh, and and I think the lines of accountability here just need to be very strongly delineated. Commissioner. Uh, just to add, I think, to what Mr. Bigger had said, I think there's three things that we're asking for <coughs> or we're indicating to the province. One is the current property tax base or the property tax system is not the source of funding that they should be looking for for implementing federal funds <laughs> for uh, provincial objectives. Um, the second is that um, uh, the province needs to come to the table, as you had said, to actually fund the infrastructure that's required to support the urban growth centers and the plans they have, otherwise the intensification will not take place, as it hasn't to date. The third is, we do need more revenue tools, and we would include in that bucket of revenue tools development charges. So it's not just a taxation base, uh, um, but there are other ways of taking funding from the appropriate places. And so we have not been specific mm -hmm. on those. Um, the City of Toronto and the changes that they've recently have there offer some opportunities on the revenue tools, but I would note that we include development charges within there. So those are the three main messages that we're trying to send through this report. If they're not clear, um, we can certainly make them clear if that covers off the interests that you were looking at. Um, thank you through your worship. I, I think it does. I, I think then maybe just to take that one step further than, you know, um, financial tools from from the development happening, you know, not pre-existing tax base and, 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 and going that way then. I, I know the mayor's said this ad, ad nauseum on, in terms of new development, pays for new development, not tax base. So I'm not sure if there's a way we can get creative with or add a word or take a word out around financial tools um, that just helps to uh, clearly identify exactly uh, where those financial tools would come from and that it is not based on the exi existing tax base. 
property tax or, or whatever that may be. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I wonder if um, uh, it would be helpful if we backed up and inserted a statement that said that Oakville believes that growth should pay for itself or that growth should bear all of its costs. And, uh, and then maybe a second sentence would be, and we call on the province to restore the Development Charges Act to the status before the 1997 amendments that gutted the Development Charges Act. Um, uh, approximately, before 1997's changes, all of the costs of growth were uh, recoverable from development charges. And uh, the terminology we use around tools and taxes has to be carefully used because the development charge is a tax, it's just a tax only on the developers. And, uh, and so we're, we don't want to tax existing, the way I would frame it is we don't want the existing residents to shoulder any tax in support of growth because it amounts to a subsidy of developers. It amounts to welfare for developers and they're the richest people in the province. So they're the last people in the province that need a handout. And since 1997, uh, Basically, the, t the property taxpayer has been bearing um, 10 to 20 percent of the cost of growth because of the various uh, exemptions and uh, subsidies that the changes in 1997 created. So does staff want to take some time to, first off, is council okay with that approach? And councillor, does that satisfy what you were saying? It does. Absolutely. Thank you. And, and staff, do you want to... Um, uh, hold this back and bring it back, or uh, what's your what's your advice on fixing this? And I have two more uh, after we do this one. Do you get me there, your, your worship? We'd, we'd like to take it back, perhaps provide a covering memo on it to uh, reflect and provide clarity on the discussion we've heard this evening. So I believe it's the October seventeenth council. Yeah, so we've got time. And uh, the other two points I would ask Council to uh, see if they uh, would like to add to this is, how do you feel about a clear, unequivocal uh, statement that the province should add private lands to the Urban River Valley, to eligibility for designation uh, with the Urban, really, Urban River Valley designation? Any, any objection to that? Absolutely not. So do you wanna, would you consider uh, adding that to this uh, document? Yeah. Your Worship, we would. Okay, and then going for broke here, uh, um, the, um, uh, Ms. Childs read a line that I quite liked that would, could be added in a spot to, um, the, to affect the issue that my friend, Councillor Elgar, raised, where <coughs> you would... Um, uh, the, the key phrase I noted down was shelter from appeals. Um, and, and I take it that you had that language prepared. Is there any member of council who would disagree with adding that language? I didn't think so. So those would be the three uh, biggies that I've heard so far tonight for uh, beefing up our submission. Yes, thank you. We'll bring that back to you by way of memo. Now, anybody else? Any other things? Uh, con Sorry. Councillor Lischina. Uh, Mr. Mr. Bigar, uh, your slide about the upper tier and single tier, um, and then reading it in the report, can you clarify where Oakville stands in, in where two tier? Yeah. Lower tier. Yes, so through you, so, Mr. Chair. Can, can you just clarify Mr. that, Chair please? Mr. Chair can clarify. So um, actually, if you're going the direction I hope you are, let me ask you, are you headed in the direction that says, we as a lower tier planning authority who take very seriously our right uh, to have a vision of our own community that reflects our community's uh, view of itself. Absolutely, you we, don't have to go further. We resent the, the, uh, the uh, loss of planning authority that's implicit in the several places that Mr. Bigger very politely pointed out the, the loss. And uh, so maybe a fourth thing would be, do we want to say a little clearer and a little stronger that, that you know, we're mad as hell about losing any of our authority in this area and we, and we insist on retaining it and they should, they, should, they should pull up their socks before we get really mad at them. I mean, how do you, how do you uh, 
I was worried as, as, uh, as Mr. Bigger was speaking that we might have been so genteel that they would not notice that we were miffed. And I wonder if we need to say a little stronger, hey, what are we, chopped liver? Uh, certainly, Your Worship. We get the sense of where you're coming from, and we'll reflect on that as well. <laughs> hey, what are we chopped so, liver? So out? yes, I would appreciate that as well. Thank you. All right. So um, this is good. Anybody else? Well, you'll have another chance next time, and uh, we'll see if we can uh, we can continue to beef it up. I will circulate to you the um, some of the uh, information that I received last week. And, and that I think may help your thinking and, and staff have already seen and it's, I think, already reflected in here. But it'll give you a chance to uh, put a second, uh, each of you have put a second set of eyes on the matter. So, um, so now we need to turn to staff for a motion um, to refer this to, or I guess we don't need to turn to staff, uh, I'll just turn to a member of council to refer this to October 17th. Councillor Elgar, and is staff okay with that as how we deal with that tonight? Any discussion on that? All in favor? Opposed? The, the, the matter is referred to October 17th. Council, would you now look at item number seven, the recommendation report for the draft plan of condominium for Mattamy at 3052 Creekshore Common? And Mr. Thun, are you back? Thank you, Mr. Bigger. Sure. Councilor Knoll. Um, in, unless anybody on council wants to see the presentation, this is a relatively routine matter and I would be prepared to move the item as is. Is there any objection by any member of council? Are there any members of the public with information for council on this matter? Councilor, you can have your wish. It's, I'll uh, move the approval of the staff recommendations contained in the report. Mr. D Mr. Thun, you're, you're batting a thousand. <laughs> you, you get approved without presenting. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed, if any, and Councillor Noel, congratulations, that carries. Well then, I guess this may be a, this may be a horse of the same color because this is a recommendation report on a draft plan of condominium for Willow Bay at uh, 2370 and 2388 Calsa Gate and also at uh, 2375 and 2393 Brawny Road. Before I entertain any suggestions from Councillor Elgar, are there any members of the public here with information for Council on this matter? Councilor Elgar, is it your view that this is also routine? I, I believe you just you just moved it, did you? Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed, if any, and that is carried. Um, now, number nine is the notice of intention to amend the designation bylaw at 3536 Wasp Crescent. And it, as you will know from reading the report, really this is a housekeeping matter designed to clarify and to, to update a, a designation that was perhaps, uh, in, by modern standards, a little incomplete in uh, setting on the record the heritage attributes that we were concerned about. And uh, if, you, uh, if you want a presentation, we can do that. And if, on the other hand, you want to affirm staff's recommendation on this, we need a mover. Councillor Hutchins was the fastest, although you guys were very close. All those in favor? Opposed, if any, that carries. Now we have the, uh, the heritage update on the Jordan Munn House and the addendum was distributed. And this is a sixth line matter, so I'm looking down the table at the, at the ward uh, for sixth line. How's the grant? Uh, we'll move the staff recommendation for number 10 as well. Discussion, all in favor? Opposed, if any, carried. Now, um, uh, a good news item, the nominations for the Ontario Heritage Trust Awards. Councillor Lischina. I would like to make a motion that the ones that are presented be uh, accepted. Thank you. Any discussion? Councillor Noll, you're fine with that? I just was very excited by one of them, in particular Mr. Ross work, so I was, uh, I was going to move it, but I'm happy that uh, my colleague did it. All right. Um, all those in favor? Opposed, if any. Congratulations. That also carries. Now you have some confidential discussion items, C1, C2, C3, and these are Committee of Adjustment appeals um, designed to, um, uh, the point of these appeals was uh, for council to uphold um, 
by appealing these decisions to uphold its uh, official plan 11.1.9, uh, which is the uh, the uh, stable community, the stable neighborhoods uh, protection period uh, uh, part. Sorry, uh, Councillor Giddings, you, I saw your hand. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Unless any of our council colleagues have any questions on it, um, one of these is in Ward 3, the other two of them are in Ward 2, and I'd be happy to move the uh, recommendations as detailed in the confidential items C1, C2, and C3. Thank you, Councillor Giddings. Councillor Elgar. Yeah, I just have one question, and it's uh, not an in-camera question. It's just to ask staff, have they had a chance to meet with any of the of the people yet that uh, were which had approval from the Committee of Adjustment at this point in time? And I'm thinking specifically really of C3. Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, my information is that there have been some meetings with respect to item C1, but not as yet as of the other two. Thank you. Councillor Chisholm. We have met with um, the owners and architects for C3, and that discussion has been taking place. There has been approval on that one. Cool. All right. Shall I put the vote? All in favor? Post if any, and those appeals are affirmed. Uh, the advisory committee minutes are now before us. Uh, is there a motion to handle the minutes of the advisory committees? Councillor Knoll? This is a, a motion to approve 12 and 13. I'll take that as yes. All those in favor? Opposed if any, and the, the committee's reports are received. We now need a motion to rise and report to council. Uh, nobody wants to go home? Councilor Hutchins wants to go home. All those in favor? And that carries. I, uh, I rise and report that the Committee of the Whole has met and made recommendations on consent item one, Public hearing items 2 and 3, discussion items 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11, confidential discussion items C1, C2, and C3, and advisory committee minutes items 12 and 13 as noted by the clerk. And a mover and seconder for the report would be in order. Councillor Lischina, Councillor Lapworth, all those in favor? Opposed, if any. The report is adopted. And uh, are, are there any forms of new business, emergency, congratulatory or condolence? Seeing none, could I have a mover and seconder for the bylaws? Councillor Knoll and Councillor Chisholm. All in favor? Opposed, if any. The bylaws are adopted. That completes our agenda. I, I, I really think I, uh, we had a great meeting and everyone made really good contributions. I appreciate the time and attention everybody gave to the town's business tonight. It's been great working with you and we're adjourned.